Okay. All right, welcome back um, to the advanced seminar in the topic on the topic about Bayesian statistics and modeling. So have a let's have a quick warm up to have a recap to think about that, to recall what we have discussed the last week. So the last week we talked about one of the most important topic for the entire semester that is called <clears throat> probability, right? So when there's no slides, just think with me. So when we, when we are talking about probabilities, we have to think about some properties of probability. So one of the um, quite important one is if we have a event and if we have multiple outcomes, and then the probability of each, each outcome associated with that event, they sum up to one. So if we have a coin, there's the, 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 the head, there's the tail, and if the probability of facing up of the head is 0.4, and then the other one for tail is 0.6, one minus 0.4, right? So probability summing up to one, this is important. And uh, this is quite trivial to know, right? It's just probability summing up to one, everyone knows that. And uh, what is more interesting is we use different terms and the terminology um, to describe different events in terms of if they are discrete or they are continuous. If we have a continuous, um, let's talk, first talk about discrete, I guess. If we have a discrete event, we use the word or the term called probability mass to describe probability, probability mass function. I recall that we have um, the example of uh, the number of tests, the number of correct tests that can be answered out of eight. So there is a histogram, there are the bars. If you sum up the bars, the height of the bars, and then they sum up to one. And then moving on to continuous events. If we have continuous events, we the term that we are using is called probability density functions, PDF. And associatedly, there is another one called the CDF, the cumulative density function. So where is the one part for the PDF in particular? So the entire area under the curve, that is one. And the cumulative density function is, as I said, related to PDF, but how they are related. So the analogy that I gave is that um, there is the example I gave, not, not so much of an analogy. So there is a um, um, distribution function, there is a vertical bar, and the bar is moving from the negative infinity part to positive infinity. And then each time we are calculating the area under the curve up to this little bar, left-hand side of the, of the vertical bar. And then we are plotting the area under the curve as the bar moves from negative infinity to positive infinity. So then associated with the normal distribution, the shape is like a sigmoid shape. <clears throat> And then where is the one here for the CDF? Well, this is easy. So the y-axis, the, the upper end of the y-axis, that is one. And then we moved on to some other interesting topics. So we, if we have not only one event, we have multiple. And to begin with, the simplest, if we have multiple, is two, right? We have two events. <clears throat> Uh, one is a code, the other one is ring. It can be code versus no code. It can be ring versus no ring. So two events, two outcomes. And then in total, we had a little example of a, <clears throat> of a table. It's a two by two table. And each number in that table, it is a joint probability. And if we sum up only per row or per column, that is the marginal probability, irrespective of the other dimensions, I only focus on one dimension. And uh, uh, the last one that we talk about is actually the, um, the tricky one, but interesting one, which is the conditional probability. So P of A given B, there's a little bar. So we will have to think about first, what is the condition? What is the answer? Uncertain where the uncertainty is resolved. So the condition part after the little bar, there's no uncertainty. And using the little um, table, we focus first on one column or one, on one row, and then to see what is the probability of a particular outcome of the other event, right? 
so conditional probability. And the example we, we had is, again, first <clears throat> a discrete example, and then we moved on to a continuous example of, again, the three um, concepts, conditional probability, marginal probability, joint probability. There is a kind of a cloud-ish -ish, um, shape, and each dot is a joint probability. And if, you, if we draw a line and then we focus on the other dimension, then there's a conditional probability. And on the x axis, on the y axis, like on the side, they are the marginal probability. <clears throat> so then the, the, more, the more important thing uh, from the last week is, was that, so we know the relationships of joint probability, joint probability, marginal probability, and conditional probability. And then what we did, we, what we did is to derive, actually, we derive the Bayes equation, the Bayes rule, so that we know that, think with me, so P of A given B equals, then first there is a, a fraction bar. On the normal return, it is um, P of B given A times P of A, then the denominator is P of B, right? So that's the, um, the Bayes equation. <clears throat> and then we ended up with kind of exercise by calculating the probability of if there is a person coming in and then the test result says you're positive and then what is actually the probability that person is indeed having that disease. And if you haven't done that, you can still do it later. Now you have the slides. <clears throat> So we, we talked about the base equation. We, we had a interesting um, calculating exercise, like disease and the tests, very interesting, in particular the COVID and the COVID conditions. But how can that be interesting? Why we talk about how can we use it? So now let's talk about it a little bit more um, today. So we want to link our data and like parameters, this is the purpose of data analysis and how the Bayes rule can be applied here, right? So think about that. If you have a clear answer, that's great. I guess what I will be talking is just a recap for yourself. <clears throat> if you have never heard about this kind of thing, it's totally fine. I will also explain to you. So think again, so this is the Bayes rule. This is the Bayes equation. And we know that we can even derive it, right, from the, um, relationships between transitional probability, joint probability, and marginal probability. And uh, so think about that. What are these uh, meanings of the letter A and B? Well, there's no answer. So the A and B, they are just arbitrary. They don't even have a meaning. And so we don't even have to assign a meaning to A and B. They're just arbitrary letters. Well, now that they are arbitrary, we can just arbitrarily replace A and B with something else. So we could say, instead of A and B, we have um, two letters or two variables. One is called theta here, and then the other one is D, let's say call that data. And now we just apply, we just insert, we just plug in all of the thetas and datas to the place where they used to be A and B. Now it becomes, maybe some of you have seen that in the paper. And this is really the equation you see very often when people are saying, well, I'm doing Bayesian equation, this is the base rule, and then I do, I do this, do that. So here, this is a more familiar case for many of you. So what does that mean? Um, in particular, um, for, for this one, for the left-hand side, one, it makes a lot of sense in the sense that if we, collect, if we do experiments and then we collect data here, then this is a D. So given the data we have, we want to know something that we don't know, but we are interested in. So this is the parameter. Let's say we have a model and we don't know, there is a, there is a parameter that's free to vary within a reasonable range between zero and one, for example. All of the values are meaningful, but given the data, what could be the distribution of this parameter, I don't know, but I can use Bayes rule to derive it, to calculate it. So this is our, our purpose to do analysis, right? Given the data that we have, what is the probability of the parameter? So it's 
in, in fact, the, the left hand side, this term, it has a name and it is called posterior. But not surprisingly, all of the little elements here and here and here, all of them, they have names. And uh, the names looks like this. Um, the red one, I told you already, so it is called posterior. So after everything is observed, what is the parameter um, pro probability of the parameter given the observed data? Contrasting to the posterior, there is something called prior here, the prior, before we have even seen the data. So the probability of theta, irrespective of data, this is not conditioning on data, it is irrespective of data. So how plausible is our parameter even before um, observing, even before conducting the experiment, the prior. <laughs> and the uh, likelihood, this term is called likelihood, here it says, well, given this kind of parameter and what is, how, how likely, what is the likelihood to reserve, to observe the data? So I have explained all of them one by one, but here for now, the rough understanding is that how plausible is the data given our parameter is true, just reverse the order, right? Conditional probability. And then there's the last one, the denominator, and the denominator is P of D, and uh, you would wonder, the data is there. What is the P of D? P of D, D is one. I have data. My <laughs> the probability of having data is one. This is not, 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 not that case. Not really. That, that is not a valid interpretation. So P of D is a little bit tricky to understand. I will also explain afterwards. But for now, uh, let's imagine in a way that the P of D is a normalizing term. It basically serves a numerical reason so that the left hand side, all of the possible values, they, have, they sum up to one. So the P of D is only serving as a, as a normal, normalizing um, role. That doesn't really have so much meaning that we have to interpret. So P of evidence. And if you really want to interpret that, it means how plausible is the data under all the possible parameters. So here, all the possible parameters means um, irrespective of the parameter then there's again a marginal probability, right? If you really want to interpret, but it doesn't matter. I will, I will tell uh, this, we, I will talk about P of D later. <clears throat> so well, maybe have, let's have a recap. This is the base rule in terms written as a function of theta and data. So theta is parameters unknown. We want to know, but unknown yet. D is the data associated from the experiment, from everything, survey data, it can also be that, brain data even. Um, we want to know the parameters given the observed data posterior. And we might also have some knowledge regarding the, prior, regarding the parameter prior to the data collection. Maybe this knowledge comes from the knowledge of the, of the field, maybe this uh, prior knowledge comes from also previous literature. Also, it can be from your pilot study. So maybe let's say you tested 10 participants and then you have a parameter value. And then, okay, let's settle down. Let's just use this paradigm and then test the 40, 50 people. And the first 10 people that belongs to your pilot can also be your prior because this is a reasonable prior, right? You did it. It's part of the, the case, part of the experiment. And then you want to carry this, carry on this information to your actual experiment. And this one is likelihood, a little bit tricky to understand, I will explain. And then the last one is evidence, P of evidence, even more tricky to explain, but actually you don't even need to understand it, really. <clears throat> okay, first, um, the likelihood. I, I want to explain likelihood first, because this is one of the most important uh, concepts when we are doing analysis, especially when we are doing modeling. So P of, it, it reads as, or it's, it, it, it is written, appears to be P of D given the, the theta. But why we don't call it probability? Why we call that likelihood? Isn't that confusing that people like statistics, earlier statisticians, they introduced another term 
likelihood to describe something that we call well, probability. Isn't that confusing or not? Well, it turns out there is a reason why people do that. So the, the, the term likelihood and probability, they do not have the same meaning in statistics rather than in life. In life, if we say, well, there's a probability I will go to uh, the office very low, and then that I could also say, well, there is a likelihood that I go to the office. Is, these are interchangeable, right? I don't even have to differentiate the meaning of using the two words when, we, when I'm saying that two sentences. <clears throat> but in statistics, they are different. Um, let me explain using one, uh, doesn't matter this kind of thing. Well, yeah, let, let, let's look at this table. Let's look at this table first. This is important. This words later, I will tell you what I mean. So let's look at this table first. Um, suppose we have two coins, so two coins. Let's say I flip the two coins one after another. And then I could have three possible combined outcomes, right? So I could have none of the two coins, the head is facing up, or maybe one head, one tail. Doesn't matter the order, it can be one head, one tail, can also be one tail, one head. That is fine. This is the same if I just don't care the order, they are the same. And there is the third uh, types, third type of outcome, which is both of the two cases of coin flipping, the head is facing up, right? So those are the three possible outcomes if we are flipping two coins consecutively. We can also do it together, it doesn't matter. And then let's assume um, we have multiple coins, coins. And here, this is the, the axis. Uh, no, is that the axis? No, this is the row, um, the row variable per row. Per row, per, per row, row variable. Um, it is the probability of the coin landing heads up. So that it basically describes if this is a is a fair coin or not. So there are we have multiple coins and the coins they don't have the same probability of heads facing up if we toss it, and they are quantified by the numbers here on the on this axis on this dimension on the row dimension. So let's just dig into that a little bit more. Um, first, this row, let's say the probability of the heads facing up is zero. So then that, that means that whatever, how many times does, it, no matter how many times I throw it, I will always get tail because the probability of heads facing up is zero. So in terms of these three possible outcomes, this is not possible, I will never get it. This is also not possible, I will never get it. I can only get tails, right? I can only get tails. And conversely, we can also understand this one. So if the probability of heads facing up is one, then I could also, I, could, I can only get one. I can get head, head, I can never get a tail. It's not possible. So these two numbers are zero. <clears throat> And uh, um, accordingly, if the probability of the, the coin facing up, the head facing up is 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So as long as we know this number, then we could calculate these things, right? So if the head facing up is 0.2, then we say, well, the probability of two consecutive heads facing up is 0 0.2 multiplied 0.2. 0 0.04, and then this number is also easy to calculate. It's 0 0.8 by 0 0.8, and then this one is one minus this and one minus that. This is pretty easy to calculate. And uh, if we say, well, if I don't know if these three numbers they sum up to one, I just want to calculate this number. Is it possible? It's also possible. We say, well, 0 0.2 multiply 0 0.8. But also we have to do it twice, multiply two, because there are two possibilities, head, tail, uh, head, tail, tail, head, so this is the order. <clears throat> and then now we have interesting observation. So the numbers per row, each of these numbers per row, you will see that they always sum up to one. They always sum up to one. And then you have another interesting observation. So per column, I will tell you the meaning, what they are, but let's forget about the meaning first. Per column, 
whatever that is, they don't sum up to that. Okay, they don't sum up to that. They don't sum up to that. What, why am I telling you this? This is a quite specific example. I spent quite some time explaining all those numbers, and let's zoom out a little bit to try to, to try to understand it in a um, from a bigger picture. So, what is the row variable? So, what is the row here? This per per line, let's say per line, what they are. So they are given that um, <clears throat> so this is the probability of uh, so given the parameter is fixed, right? So here is given the parameter is fixed, and uh, then we know the probability of the outcome. Given the parameter is fixed, we know the probability of the outcome. Given the parameter is fixed, we know the probability of the outcome. Yeah. So this is indeed the meaning of P of D given theta. So if we are talking about P of D given theta, we are talking about when the theta is fixed, what is the probability of the outcome? When the theta is zero, what is the probability of this three outcome? When theta is 0.2, what are the three numbers? When theta is fixed to be 0.4, what are the probability of the three outcomes, right? When theta is fixed. However, on the column, this is the case when what is fixed. So when the observation is fixed. So let's say I have two coins. I toss it, and both of the two times the tails were uh, faced up, so zero, zero of height, right? I don't know the probability of the two coins. I only have the observation, the two tails, tail tail. I only know that, and I would like to use the tail tail outcome or the tail tail um, data, the evidence to infer what can be the probability. What can be the theta? What can be the theta? So you see what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about when data is fixed, I want to know the parameter, which is actually the posterior, right? Right? I don't know that, but I want to know it. So now you will see why people don't usually use this word, this term, as probability, because they this this um this term is actually violating the assumption of being probability. If I give you this one, P of D given theta, without further explanation, you would just naturally think about theta is fixed. I want to know the probability of theta. Then this is per row, right? This is fine. But in reality, we collect the data. We do not have multiple possible outcomes of the data. We only have one fixed possible, one fixed outcome of the data. We have this. This is already there. This is already observed. Today. We can't even change the data. But this one is changing. So this is per column. Those numbers, they don't sum up to one. So this is violating the, the assumption of being a probability. So it means it is not even a probability. <clears throat> so in literature, people want to, uh, this is quite confusing, right? I guess when I, when I was describing, I was confused for a second. I guess I was confusing you also. So people are confused in general, and then they say, well, let's use another term maybe. Let's use the letter likelihood. So here L means likelihood. And then we, we, we just change the order a bit. So this is easier to understand. After the bar, this is condition. Given the condition we have, what is the likelihood of the parameter being uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, okay? So this is the likelihood. So as a relatively quick summary, what is the likelihood? Likelihood is a number that describes uh, something when the data is fixed, how likely is each parameter value? So it is a function of theta. Theta is the changing variable, not data, okay? So I guess this is kind of a, a pretty detailed 
explanation of why likelihood is not probability. And now you also know the reason. So now if you look at here, these two points, so data is fixed, theta varies. So here this explains um, what, is, what I just told. It is not a probability function. The sum is not one. It is then also uh, what I showed you. <clears throat> Conceptually, the likelihood is quite important, not only because it is deviating from the meaning of probabilities, not that. So the importance of likelihood is that likelihood is the model part, the actual model part. What does that mean? That means if we want to have, uh, if we want to model the data, if we want to apply statistical models to the data, if we want to apply cognitive models to the data, what does that mean? So cognitive model and statistic model, they, in the at the end of the day, they will only, they will always be narrowed down to a certain likelihood function. So the likelihood is the model. If we say, I want to model something, then um, we could alternatively say that I would like to find the proper or the appropriate likelihood function to link um, the observed data together with the unknown process that we're interested in, for instance. We will, we will encounter the concept uh, more and more throughout the entire lecture. But let's just take it, keep in mind now that two points, let me sum, quickly summarize. Likelihood first, it is the central part of doing modeling. So if we want to model something, we find the proper likelihood function. For this is one. Two, likelihood function is not a probability. It is different from a probability for the reason that I showed to you. It doesn't sum up to one. Okay, it doesn't sum up to one. Good. Some question here, doesn't the assumption, so Florian asks, uh, doesn't the assumption that we have the data, some counterintuitive, given how much decisions researcher in, in regard to the research design influences the data we have to analysis, or do we miss some, do I miss some point? Yeah, this is a kind of a good point. So let's say this is related to open, to the open question, open science reproducibility kind of thing. So let's say um, I collected 20 participants, the data from 20 participants, and it's not, not significant for some analysis. I don't know, the t-test. And maybe I collected one more, another more, third, fourth, and then until I have 28, for example, and then I run the same analysis. Yeah, that's significant. <laughs> so is that a good practice or not? Um, so it, it depends on the, if there is a, a stopping rule, right? You really have to say, well, I just, according to previous literature, I say, I just want to test 20. If they're not significant, it's not significant. It's part of the, it's part of the story. You don't want to have a kind of a hike, P, kind of a P hiking rule to collect the data until it is significant. This is really not a good practice. It is not, so the answer is not, this is not a good thing. But does that matter? If we do Bayesian analysis, the answer is not. So the Bayesian statistic, it doesn't care about the p-value thing. It's, that is a different, it's, it is a different frame. So if we have two, 20 participants, yeah, we can do the analysis. If we have 28, we can also do the analysis. Maybe the result will change. This is also why the base equation, the basic, um, analysis can help us if we have more evidence. We can see some examples later, but um, the idea is, Bayesian analysis it doesn't care about the stopping rule. There's, this is not even relevant. Is, does that answer your question or maybe just I completely answered your question in a different direction? Yeah, okay, good. So is the likelihood something like a range of possible of the probabilities given certain data? Um, yeah, kind of. So um, let's do it this way. <clears throat> so 
let's say I have again the example, same example, the coin example. Here this outcome, and we have our um, the outcome of the of the coin token, right? And then let's say, well, I have both of the times a one. Okay, one here means head and zero means tail. <clears throat> so this is our data. We have our data. And then let's say um, we have a parameter. The parameter is unknown. The parameter is describing what is the probability of the coin facing up. It can be zero, it can be 0.1, can be 0.2, up to one. It can be 0.001, right? This is a continuous variable. Good. We know it. Uh, what is the sign here? This one, I think. Zero, one. This is our, da our data. Uh, let's call it data. It's better. This is our data, one and one, head and head. And the theta is a parameter. This means belongs to this one. Theta belongs to a range between zero and one. This is everything we know. And we want to calculate something like for each theta, what is the likelihood to observe one one? So when theta is zero, what is observe? What is the probability of observing one one? When theta is 0 0.001, what is the likelihood of observing one one? And until when theta is this? Right, so it is a continuous space from zero and one. This is a continuous space, but we can just this. I'm not sure this is a word. Discretize, <laughs> discretize, kind of to make it to become this discrete variable. And um, um, instead of working on continuous space, which involves integral and is a little bit tricky, and we want to work with that, we want to with we want to work with numbers, easier numbers, discrete variables. And we have let's keep this a little bit easy. So we take a step size of one o five, okay, and one. And so then we could calculate when theta equals zero, what is the likelihood of observing one and one? When theta equals 0 0.05, when theta equals 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, until when theta, this is comma, until when uh, theta is one, okay? This is a kind of a expression to say, I want to take a series of numbers from zero to one with a step size of 0.05 or interval, however you call that. And actually, x axis, we know that well, this is zero one, this is basically theta, right? We know it's continuous. And for the y axis, what we want to do, we want to calculate the likelihood. What is the likelihood? The likelihood is when the data is fixed, and we, are, we want to know the, how likely is each how likely each theta is when we have the data, we, when we have the data one and one, okay? This is the, um, y axis. So now what we do, we just have to calculate. Um, yeah, so what we do now is we will have to calculate the likelihood. And to calculate that, we need to use some equations, right? And then the equation here, and it requires that we know a little bit more about the st statistical distribution. So it's actually will come later, but I can tell you now. So the distribution, the likelihood function here is called a um, Bernoulli function. So it describes when we have only a yes, no kind of binary answer, head, tail, yes, no, one, two, zero one kind of thing. And if you go to exam, you can answer only correct or incorrect. So just binary one, two, yes, no kind of events. Uh, it follows a probability. So the probability of getting head and a probability of getting tail, right? And then there is a Bernoulli kind of function. And the Bernoulli function, um, you can just also look it up and then to uh, insert the numbers. 
So if we say we have a Bernoulli function, we have a Bernoulli function, which is called bear. Bernoulli function, so when we have uh, the data is one, one, right? D equals one, one. Yeah, same. So given that, and uh, then um, so the theta. Same thing, we just replace L, the more generic term, to something more specific. And then there will be an equation. We can look it up on Wikipedia, you can also calculate the NR. So when theta, this is kind of more, more generic, this is Fx, right, or F theta. Theta is changing. When theta is zero, what is, the, what is F theta? When theta is 0 0.05, what is Y? When theta is 0 0.1, what is Y? So then you will have a, curve. So in this particular case, the curve looks like this. Yeah, because either when theta is zero or when theta is one, you could never be able to observe one, one, this kind of head head example. And the highest point, there's a point 0.05, obviously, because, because, no, no, wait, I think I give you a wrong curve. Well, let's, let's change this one to zero. I don't have, don't want to change the curve. If you have one head, one tail, then the curve is like below, okay? <laughs> so uh, you, you just follow the same procedure. The data is one, one head, one tail, and you plug in each of the theta in a fine space, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, until uh, one, you get a curve. And each of, each of the curve, I guess I should change a different color now. All right, it's getting too busy. So each of the, the number here, they mean, so given we have a zero, one data observation, this x, this y number, this y axis, this number is the likelihood of observing this data point when theta is point one, for example. And this is the likelihood of observing had one head one tail when theta is 0.2. This is the likelihood of observing one head one tail when theta is 0.3. And then we could go to, there is this point, the, uh, the top, the peak of the curve. So this is the likelihood <clears throat> of observing one head one tail when the theta is 0.5. So now imagine this again. So we have a curve, right? This is great, we like curves. And if there is a curve, what we can do now is, so usually people want to find out um, where the peak of the curve is. So luckily we do have a peak. This point is the max. So we know that, the, the, let's change it here a little easier. So we have a curve and the x, y axis is L, right? So this is the likelihood. And this one is the top. What is that? The maximum likelihood. So if you heard about, there's a term called maximum likelihood estimation. You just do a curve, find the peak. The peak is the maximum likelihood. Then that's your parameter. This is, that is likely maximum likelihood estimation. That's we are already talking about different things now. A little bit um, too away from our main story. But anyway, this is likelihood. And I, Using this example, you will actually also be able to understand maximum likelihood function. Why we want to do maximum likelihood function. So let me give you like kind of a, from the beginning to the end, the summary of what we have done here. It's kind of a little bit tricky. We just look at different pieces of the same thing, but not in a systematic way. So now let's say I have two coins. This is, these are my participants and I have two coins. I want to find, and I also assume that these two coins, they have the same probability of heads facing up because the same, they come from the same manufacturing fun, uh, factory. But I don't know what the number is. I just have these two coins. I, I recruited two participants. I don't know how they can solve my task, but I just asked them to come into the lab, okay, two coins. But I want to know the probability of the heads facing off of the two coins. What can we do? What can I do? And I do experiment with the participant. I do experiment with the coins. Flip, catch, flip, catch. Observation, one head, one tail. So how could I know the probability of the coins when I have 
one head, one tail data, I want to estimate the theta parameter. I happen to know that this kind of head tail yes no observation follows a binomial by binomial and Bernoulli distribution. I tell you binomial later. The same thing, more more or less. I happen to know that this process it follows a binomial and versus slash Bernoulli uh, process. It follows the Bernoulli binomial distribution. I happen to know that equation, and then I will be able to calculate the likelihood of each theta from zero to one in a continuous space, but I just use small steps to make it discrete. And I'm able to calculate the likelihood given my observation, one head, one tail per theta parameter. And the, the, the outcome of this calculation is plotted on the y-axis. And those are the likelihood. And then the next step, the final step is simply to find out the max. So this parameter, 0.5 is maximizing the likelihood given that I have observed one head, one tail. Okay, so summarize again, I want to know the probability of the two coins. I do experiment with the two coins. I know the process, the likelihood function, and then I do parameter estimation, likelihood, maximum likelihood, like maximum likelihood function. And then I observe the results. I obtain the result 0.5. Then I read the paper. Okay, hey, thank you, the factory sending me uh, for sending me the two coins. I can tell you that your two coins they have a 0.5 probability that maximizes the likelihood. So, story finished. <clears throat> so there's a long answer to the question, I guess. So there's a question: um, Is p of d given theta really l? Theta given data and the normal rules of reading probabilities don't apply anymore. Is yeah, it's kind of a convention thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a good question. <clears throat> I will get, get back to you uh, one second later. Do you have any questions regarding what I draw here? <laughs> One head, one tail, maximum likely, maximum likelihood estimation. Get a parameter, and then this is that. The semester is done. Okay, you you know this. You can do analysis. <laughs> okay, good, good, perfect. All right, to the other question. <clears throat> so the question is. If we have P of D given theta, does that always imply likelihood function or not? Right? This is, this is what you're asking, I believe. Mm -hmm. So the answer is, if I write down this term, I don't know. So it can be per row, it can be per column. And if you only write this term, I would use my statistics knowledge to say, well, this is perhaps probability because it's written as this way. It is probability of theta given theta. So it applies the row, this row variable per, per line. So this is fine. We are happy with that. We're comfortable with that. What is violating the rule? And when, what is the point we have to call it a likelihood? It is when it is written on the, uh, so here, if that term appears here versus when I have another term, I just write down this way. I have two cases, one, I write down P of D given theta. It is our normal interpretation. However, you have to do it, you just do it. And then we have a second scenario. When the same term appears to be part of the nominator, nominator of the base rule, of the Bayesian equation. So then it doesn't apply. It, it, it becomes a likelihood. Then what we know is a little bit counterintuitive. We have to do it the other way around. So it becomes likelihood. Does that answer? I guess, yes. But let me know if not. Yeah.
Okay, if you are, this is confusing, I, I know that. So if, the, if this is confusing, and if you think that is still confusing, there is a good video that you can watch and he explains very much better than I do. And in fact, I do encourage you to watch the videos from this channel, it's called Stats, StatQuest. And uh, he explains a lot of interesting statistic concept, concepts, statistical concepts, uh, and also some machine learning and interesting stuff. It's really good ones, good stuff. And let's take a look. First, this one, and then the others from him as well. All right. Explaining likelihood function takes a lot of time, and then the, the remaining is actually easy. So the next one of Again, the base equation, we have four terms. I explained likelihood, the most difficult one, but we're done. And another one is prior distribution. So what is prior? Prior means as the name suggests, um, the probability distribution before we even know the data. But now you just can wonder that it, what, what that can be. Can it be anything? Well, it's a little, a little bit in that direction. So there are a few ways to quantify our vague knowledge, right? So if I have two coins, and if I don't even do experiments, how come I am able to imagine the probability of the two coins? I have no idea. So it can be anything. So then in that particular case, zero, one, right? This x-axis, y-axis. And then there is a flat prior. So anything in between the range zero and one, they are possible. They are possible. So this is, called uniform prior, uniform prior, because this is uniform distribution, it's a single line. Or maybe you can also call that flat prior, just flat prior, anything is possible. And then there is a counter, counter argument. So counter argument says that anything is possible, it sounds vague, but it is actually a super strong prior conceptually because you are assuming anything is possible, everything is possible in between zero and one. Is that possible? So this is kind of the counter argument of people who are a little bit against um, using flat prior. I'm okay with that, but some people they don't like it. And then they say, well, if if and that's, and then the other people say, well, if you don't like flat prior, you can be against it, fine. But can you come up with some alternatives, right? You, you tell me what is wrong, but please also tell me what to do, which is right. So the people, they say, well, maybe we call something a weekly, weekly informative prayer. So it's as written here. So let's say, I'm just, most of the case, in most of the cases, I believe the coins are fair. They come from fact manual factories. They have quality check before they coming into um, the, the markets then we get the, the coins. There are people who check it to check it is more or less the same weight, both sides, right? So let's say I have a genuine trust into the manufacturers, then I will say I have a quite good understanding to, 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 be, to, um, to, um, to convince myself the coins are fair. So then the knowledge will be more or less around 0.5, right? This is 0.5. I, I genuinely believe it. But how much I believe it, there are two possibilities to do that. So one is I have a kind of a pretty vague belief around it. I could also be like super precisely believe it. That should be symmetrical, whatever. <clears throat> I just, these are two ways, right? So here, the first one, this is this first one I draw. This is weakly informative. It is informative. The peak is around 0.5, but there is a large uncertainty. And this one is called informative prior. It, it is really informative. I'm just super be, uh, believe, I'm super convinced that all of the coins, they are just fair. And I don't even believe all the other values. 0.7, not possible. 0.9, even not possible then I can use this two prior knowledge um, to de uh, derive the theta after I have had tail data as the evidence. Okay, good. Now I guess you might have kind of another concern maybe. So we now have already three ways to, there are more, but at least the three 
three ways of constructing our prior distribution. The first one is uniform flat prior, and the second is uninformative or weakly informative prior, and then this one is informative prior. Okay. Practically, what to use? So it's actually up to you. It depends on the, your your research question. I think you you really so. So my thinking is that, well, you can use anything as long as you have a good justification. You justify why you do it. So let's say if I'm just a random person on the street, maybe I do this. And if let's say I have a genuine belief in our manufacturing in terms of Euro, how that is produced, then maybe I'm the second one. But maybe in this case, if you are a like a worker, you work at the manufactory, you are producing the coin, you do all of the quality check. Those are done in your, within your hand. Maybe you just really believe it, right? You believe it's otherwise not possible, right? This depends on your, your standing. And as long as you can justify it, I think this is, this is accepted, okay? Good. <clears throat> and when doing research is a little bit different. So if I have data, if I do analysis, how should I, how am I, how I will be able to justify my prior? That's a little bit tricky. So there's no ground truth in the first place. So the participants are not built to do my experiments only in one way, not the other. It's not like producing the coin the way then we could able, we are able to produce a person. It's not that, it doesn't work that way. So we could follow literature to, but I think if we do like, uh, if we could follow some literature, the second way, this one, is more preferred because we could we are able to use knowledge accumulated from pre previous literature, but we might have a larger variance. We believe it, but not so much. And then let's see how the new evidence will change my belief. Right? Make sense? <clears throat> Good. Okay, good. And then the next term um, is here, this one, the P of D. As I told you, the P of D doesn't serve as a interesting interpretation. We don't even have to interpret it. It only serves as a normalizing term so that the left-hand side, the posterior, so there's a sum up to one. This is like a normalizing term. <clears throat> and it is actually quite difficult to calculate so if you remember how to write down, how to just unpack P of D, you could do that either in this way, if the event is continuous, uh, if the event is discrete, discrete, it can also be this way when the event is continuous, right? So the discrete variable looks easier at least because we can just sum up and then the continuous variable is a little bit not easy. So there is the integral. But either way, they're not so intuitive to, to calculate. And then there are a lot of uh, computing power lost there. And uh, usually we, we try to avoid it, <clears throat> OK? So P of D, what we can remember, we can remember that it's for normalizing, for one, for numerical reasons, for normalizing. For two, it's difficult to calculate, OK? Remember that. <clears throat> good, good. Now let's just talk about that a little bit more. So we talk about prior likelihood and uh, P of D and uh, the posterior. <clears throat> so why are we interested in that? So let's say, so imagine at the table that I gave to you, the table where I have two, two coins. And if I know the probability, I can calculate the outcome, each how probable each outcome is <clears throat> per line. I can also go to the column. If I have observed the data already, <clears throat> I want to know what is the more likely parameter, pro like in this way, in this dimension, right? There are two processes. And then this can be, <clears throat> excuse me. So this can be summarized a little bit in this diagram. diagram. So here, let's say, if I know the cause, then I will definitely know the, re the result, right? So that's per row. If I know the parameter, if I know the probability of has facing up of the coin, I can really calculate the probability of per event, okay? 
And let's say if I know the parameter, and then this is also how the experimental data is generated. There's the truth, and then there is the experimental data followed by the truth. Good. <clears throat> and what do we do next? We do, well, we can observe the data and we don't really know the ground truth, even though maybe it's there, maybe not, but we want to know it. We will use our um, collected data. We run behavior experiment. We run functional neural imaging experiment. And we would like to know, given the data, what is the possible cause? What is that? That is called statistical inference, right? We infer what can be something interesting is that cognitive um, domain, maybe emotion, maybe anything like behavior, motivation, whatever you learned before, what are the causes? And we use our data and then we do inference to get it. <clears throat> So if you think about that, from known data to the unknown cause to do inference, isn't that the same as probability of theta given data? So given the data we have, and how can we infer the theta? It is the same, right? So essentially, um, getting or calculating the posterior is really what we really want to do. We just want to have the unknown parameter given the data. We want to infer what can be the cause. <clears throat> this is indeed our aim to do statistical analysis. <clears throat> and now you might wonder another thing. Well, if this is already what we do from the data to do inference, why I have never heard about this? So maybe I just assume not so many people of you have heard about posterior. So I just assume that way and then let's say, if we do is this every day, why I haven't heard about this? This isn't that strange, right? It is strange. It is strange, honestly. So because to calculate posterior, you need to get this one, right? To use the basic equation to get this. And then there's the P of D part, which you can't easily get rid of. It's quite difficult. So then there are some easier ways to calculate it, and which is with the aim to approximate posterior. So our usual way to do statistics is also trying to understand it, at least in my opinion. But and then because of a few reasons, we can't really get the actual posterior. And then we do some alternative ways. So, so I guess it's um, non-significant frequent, how does that call it? Non-significant hypothesis test, right? P-value, I, I, I don't know. But you know what I mean? That, that is also kind of, that comes from a little bit different theoret um, kind of theoretical and philosophical perspective, kind of a little bit different. But from the evidence to infer the cause, I think this is the same, okay? Good, hope not, I'm not confusing you so much. So then there is a guy, he basically once said that probability, I guess, especially he meant a posterior probability, is orderly opinion and inference from data is nothing other than the reverse of such opinion in light of relevant new information. <clears throat> Good. Any questions here? Maybe it's worth um, summarizing again. So here at the bottom, this is the base equation. We want to know the posterior. And then we have three other parts, prior, likelihood, and the P of data. And for prior, we could remember that um, there are multiple ways to construct the prior distribution. It can be flat prior. It can be uninformative prior. It can be strongly informative prior, this narrow thing, remember? And all of them are valid, but as long as we have a good justification, depends on what we want also. Then we have the likelihood. The likelihood, remember two things, as I said, this is the model part. If I want to say, I want to model my data, okay, good, find the proper likelihood function. This is the model. For two, this is not the same as probability distribution, probability function is not, because if you compute all of the possible likelihoods, if you sum them up, it doesn't add up to one. So it's violating assumptions, so that is not probability. The P of D 
remember also two things. First, it the function is the role. The functional role is to um, normalize numerical uh, considerations for only normalizing. Second, it's difficult to calculate either for discrete or continuous variables. Either cases, not easy, but there are ways to get rid of it. Okay, so this is the full picture, I think, of the basic equation. <clears throat> Does that make sense? There's a question it says, what for does the posterior take? And how can you interpret it? How it is comparable to a p-value? It's not the same as a p-value. Um, yeah, I guess it's worth discussing a little bit. <clears throat> I will explain the posterior a little bit later, but now I can tell you the p-value. So can anyone tell me what the p-value means? If let's say, well, p is equals or smaller than 0 0.05, okay, good. What does that mean? And maybe you can, any of you volunteer to speak up? I think typing that is takes too much time. Um, this value kind of means that if our assumption or our theory is not true, how likely it is that we still observe uh, outcome that makes it seem true. It's getting, it's getting there, not so precise. <laughs> Any other I, volunteers? I have an idea. Okay. I think um, uh, it's a it's probability that the effect we find isn't actually there. Isn't actually there. Okay, and it's more. the uh, I, Irtums Wahrscheinlichkeit. I don't know what <laughs> what's the a good translation, but yeah, it's how likely it is that the effect we found in our data isn't actually in the data. Okay, okay. Any other right. ideas? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thank you. And what else? I think even for me, I can't really memorize the, the exact definition of p-value. But what I can tell you for, ah, this is a long detour, but maybe it's worth it. Okay, let's say there's a t-test, t, t right? Let's say we have two groups and we have two hypotheses. We have the, the null hypothesis, H0, and we have alternative hypothesis, H1. And then the H0 says, well, we have two means. And let's say just only one mean. And the mu is the, the numerical average of the sample. So we have a group of people and uh, we want to make a group of people who are taking tests and there are 10 questions. And then let's say is um, whether the, the mean, the average score of the test equals to um, five, for example, just a random example is arbitrary. Okay, just let's see if people are behaving well, better than average, better than, better than average, average five. Good. And then we have an alternative uh, hypothesis. We say, well, it's not equals to, it's larger than five. Yeah, this is how we know it. <clears throat> so the, the T, P value here in this particular case, there is a quite special assumption. The assumption, the, the assumption is always that. So given the non-hypothesis is true, right? So given this is true, and let's say this is five, and then let's say there's something distributed around five. Let's say given this is true. So what is the probability to observe something like bigger than that and even more extreme? So all of the area here. So our data maybe says, well, the, the observation is eight. Does that fall in here or maybe not? Yeah, kind of. I tried. I'm not kind of a p value person. <laughs> so the important part is here, right? We assume the non-hypothesis non -hypothesis is true. 
what is the possibility to extreme something larger or extreme or even more extreme? So this is a threshold and then even more extreme. And can we write it down in the sense that we are doing, can we write it down as a conditional probability? I think, yes. So H zero, here we have mu is five. This is the condition. This is a condition, right? And we have P, P what? Well, then maybe P of data. What is that? This is a likelihood function. This is a likelihood function. So this is like the parameter. This is the data, right? <clears throat> so the P value, the P testing is not kind of the same as post posterior probability. So if I convinced you earlier, this is too busy, right? Want to use this one? Yeah, if I convinced you earlier, posterior is inference from data to parameter, but this is not really not usually easy to, to do. And then people have different ways to approximate it, maybe only from here. So p p value testing is kind of a way to, to approximate it, but not exactly the same. So that is why when we have a non, not um, um, significant results. We don't really accept the non hypothesis. Does that make sense? I guess I will just assume that makes sense. Okay, good. So if you have no more questions so far at this point, and we could have a more concrete example of understanding how to use our Bayes rule to do some analysis. And here we use a binomial model, and this is just like a coin flipping, and I told you already earlier. But let's make the example a little bit more engaging. Um, let's assume that we are interested in, we are curious about how much of the surface is covered in water. So let's assume there are only two kinds of materials. One is water, the other one is land covering the, the earth. And we're interested in the proportion of water. And uh, we can measure that, we can send a satellite to measure the proportion of water, proportion of land. But uh, we just want to do a simple and quick experiment. We don't have satellites. So what to do? So maybe you go to a store and then you buy a globe. Buy a globe. Globe is like a, a good approximation to the Earth, right? To, the, um, to our Earth. And what you can do is you're just holding the, the ball, the globe. You toss it up and then you catch it. And then you record under your right index finger, what that is, is that water, is that land? So you just close your eye, catch and throw in the catch. Is that water, is that land, is that water, is that land? Or something like that. So because the globe is a good approximation, it's a small world. It is representing the big world of the earth. And we are trying to infer it infer from the small world to the big world. The, the, the logic here is the same as doing human experiments when we are running experiments. So there are um, <clears throat> more than 10 million people in the world. We can't really rec recruit, invite anyone to our lab. This is the big world. Instead, we recruit 50, 60 people, 100, 200 people. This is a small sample. This is like the globe. This is the small world. And if we find something and we try to infer if that maybe applies also to the um, other people, right? the entire population, <clears throat> the same logic. Okay, anyway, 
there's a big word problem, there's a small word problem. Big word problem, difficult to handle, either expensive or maybe becomes even, we don't have the capacity to do it. But instead we have the capacity to, to work with small world. And we throw it in the air and then we catch it, either water or land. Now what do we have? If we run an experiment, we have data. If we throw the globe into, into the air, we catch it, we have data. So what our data looks like? How does our data look like? <clears throat> And let's assume that we just do an experiment nine times. We have water, land, water, land, water, land, like a few, a few times. And uh, out of the nine times, we do the experiment nine times, six of them are water. So you see here the entire sequence is one water, one land, and a few times water, and then land, water, land, then here, let's say it's like, it looks like this. And now, as, so just intuitively, if you are doing this experiment, so what is the proportion of water covering the universe, not universe, covering the Earth, right? The surface of our Earth. You just do the simple division. Six by nine, okay, it's two thirds. Then is this answer correct or not? We have to do a little bit more uh, detailed analysis. So then that comes to Bayesian analysis. And you might wonder, well, if I get two thirds, how much I can go wrong. Isn't that correct? So the, in the, the, um, <clears throat> the, the idea looks like this. So you have water land, water land, that this is the data, right? This is the same as we have one head, one tail, one head, one tail. If I have one head, one tail, then I say there's a 50%. This is not a fair conclusion because the data is quite limited. If I have one head, one tail, but if I do more, then all of the others are tail. So one head, one tail, then tail, 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 tail. tail. Well, then this is a super biased coin. But if I do one, two times of experiment, one head, one tail, then it looks 0.5, but then it's not. So here the idea is the same. So if we have a biased globe or earth, so if this number is 0.3 or 0.9, 0.8, are we able to observe this sequence? It's, it's possible, right? Everything is random. You just uh, throw in the catch, throw in the catch. There are tons of different possibilities that you will be able to observe this curve at this sequence. And then we are trying to find out the relative credibility of each number. And then we can only do this by using Bayesian equation, Bayesian analysis. <clears throat> so before even going into the, the, this specific example, and then there's something that I want to tell you even from the beginning. So it applies to any kind of modeling. If we want to say, well, I told you, I want to do modeling, what that means, that means I need to find a proper likelihood function that links the data to the unknown parameter. But what is the unknown parameter in this case? Well, in this particular case, the unknown parameter is the number that describes the proportion of water covering the land. Okay, this is what we know. And if we want to do some learning tasks, decision making, some memory tasks, there are some kind of parameters that you will be interested in. And then you will just derive a model and then you do model estimation. Okay. But there are a few more steps in between. So the first one is actually, what is your data generating story, your, your data story? So think about how the data comes from, how the data is generated. So let's use another simple example. Again, the coin example. It can only be head and tail, head and tail. So what is the reason it lands with a head facing up? versus tail facing up. What is the reason the coin behaves this way? So first, there's a physical reason. It's just two sides. It rarely stands there. It's two sides. There's a physical reason for that. This cannot be modeled. Well, in a, in a statistical way. In a physical way, yes. A statistical way, no. Two sides. And then there's a probability. So if, if the coin is fair, then the weight of the two sides is relatively equal. And if the coin is unfair, maybe one side is heavier, the other, the other side is, is lighter. And it is the weight that determines which side will be more likely to be uh, facing up 
or down if you determine uh, the, 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 the heavier side. So this is the reason. So this is the data generating story. So the data generating story is quantified by the relative weight of the two sides of the coin. And then the two weights of the two sides of the coin will have a probability for each side facing up. And then this is the number that results in our observation, head tail, head tail. And then this is the particular data story that we have. And you could imagine there is a learning task that we are more familiar with <clears throat> um, in psychology, for instance. So if I give you a choice and I give you an option, so there's, oh, there's just some option, doesn't matter. I give you this, I give you this one. And uh, if you say you will uh, accept it, and then there is a probability, probabilistic reward. And if I reject it, nothing will happen. So um, the probability reward also is associated with a prob probabilistic, prob probabilistic risk. So this is a risky decision making. So if I say, I give you an option, the option says you have 50% of the chance to win five euro and 50% of the chance to lose three euro. Do you want it? Or maybe not. And if I say, I have to give you another example, I have 50% of the chance win six, but 50% of the chance lose 100. Well, you don't want to lose, right? Maybe you say, no, 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 thank you. I don't want to have this option. And then what we have as data, we have the behavior either reject or accept. And then what can be the data generating story? Why, what drives the participants to say yes or no to the option? One simple idea is basically, we can compare the numbers, right? So if the positive part that the money you can gain possibly versus the money you will be losing possibly, what is the difference? Five minus three is okay, I can get two net. And five minus 100, is too, too negative and I don't want to have it. And it is this number that will drive behavior. So we could input the difference between win and loss and then to run analysis to see how that can predict as accept versus reject behavior. So this is another data story. So luckily here we have a similar data story for this coin flipping example, also for the globe flipping example, they share the same data generating story. So we can have an easier one for now to start with. So when we have a data story, so what we can do is, well, I know the data story, I have a supposed knowledge about how the data is generated, but I still don't know the, the, the parameter, right? I want to know it. I have a, a, a theory that how the data were generated, but how I can use this knowledge to get the parameter that I was eventually interested in. So I update my model. Here the update means I have a data generating theory and the data generating theory, if you think about what we have talked today, the data generating story is in fact the likelihood. This is the likelihood. And you have data, you have likelihood, and then you also have some prior. You use the prior, you have data, you have likelihood, you use the prior use the data, you use the likelihood to update the knowledge. And then what it becomes, it becomes posterior. So it becomes the knowledge of the, the parameter given the data we have. And we could also do some evaluation. So now we have a simple model. It doesn't matter. We can evaluate nonetheless, but for uh, complex models, maybe we have multiple data generating stories. So for that, decision, risky decision-making task I gave you. Some people, maybe they're risky uh, seeking, some people they're risky uh, risk seeking, and uh, the other people are risk aversive. So they, some people just want to take risks. Some people, they tend not to in general as a, like a general, like baseline behavior pattern in their lives. How can you incorporate this one into your analysis? They are just different data stories, right? And you come up with the data story that means they are different likelihood functions. They are different models, you test model, and then you evaluate your model, you compare model, and then to find out which is much more appropriate, much more plausible 
in explaining your observed behavior data in this case. And if that works, happy story, we can finish. We can write it up and then publish as a paper. But if maybe some of the data story is not even explaining the behavior, then what you can do is to you change, you revise, you educate, and you make it better. You improve your data story. You just re you refine your likelihood, likelihood function. OK? We will talk about all of these things later at later points. So there, let's keep it easy. <clears throat> And this one I will also skip. So, what is the data story of the globe? As I told you, data globe, the, the sto data story of the globe. I told you already. I think two sides they might have different weights, and then this, there will be a, a probability of one side, each side landing up. So there's a kind of a probability. Let's call that theta. And another assumption is that each single toes, you, you toes you catch, you toes you catch, each single toes. They have the same probability. It's not that that is. It is not the case that I throw once, I catch. Then the probability changes from the first time to the second time. It, it doesn't change. It's the same. So each single experiment, they follow the same process. And uh, we also know that the probability of the land facing uh, under your right index finger is one minus. So this is also we know. And uh, another. Assumption is so each toes of the globe is independent of the other. What that means? That means the result of my first experiment doesn't affect my second. The second doesn't affect the third. So all of them, they are independent. If you shuffle the order, it doesn't matter. So there is no dependency among your trials if we think about this um, in, a, if, in a environmental experimental setup. And then we have a Bernoulli function. And uh, this looks a little bit uh, too much, but actually not really. So it just means what is the probability of getting a outcome according to the theta and according to how many times you are doing this experiment, OK? So if you want to have an explanation, and uh, I think this is maybe doesn't really matter. I can skip this. So remember the coin example where I have one head, one tail, and I have this kind of curve. This follows the, the rule. This follows this function. This follows the function. OK? Maybe I will explain a little bit. So if I have a coin, I have two sides, one head, one tail. So this will be the probability of head facing up. Then when one minus that will just be tail, right? So then if I observe, if I do n times, capital N times of experiments, I observe W times of head, then I will observe N minus times of tail. So you just multiply them together. So let's say if I have two, if I have a coin, point two facing up, if I do experimental twice, I will just do point two multiply to point two, right? Then this will just be point eight, point eight, and multiply that together. And then this is to calculate how many times are there, what are the possible, what are the possible sequences, and the order doesn't matter in this case. So this is how to unpack it. But you can take a, a deeper look uh, at home. I think I don't need to explain that now. I think. <clears throat> okay, so this one, this is the likelihood function, and it is replaced in this particular case to be a Bernoulli, a binomial function. This is a particular likelihood function. And then capital N, as I told you already, means the total number of observations. We did nine times of experiments, n equals nine in this case. Out of the nine times of experiments, we have six times of water. Then W just means water in this case, six. Theta is the proportion of water covering the entire uh, Earth. The unknown parameter, the unknown proportion, we call that theta, OK? And then this is our whole setup. And we have the data, 6, 9. We have the model, the binomial. And the next thing is to get the parameter. That's something, I think, for next time, OK? <clears throat> Good. Any questions here?